Hi folks, so we're going to start out today doing a little bit of review and um, a reminder about some of the important uh, thermodynamic equations that we're going to be encountering in biochem this year. Um, and these are the kind of the key ones that we'll need. Uh, and if you notice, they all have this delta G in common. Now, delta G, as we know, tells us whether a reaction is going to be spontaneous, which is what we care about. So, really, the important thing to know is that delta G uh, is for spontaneity. Is something going to happen or not? That's what we care about. That's the important part. Okay. Delta G naught is another concept altogether. It's kind of about spontaneity, but remember that delta G is theoretical. Delta G naught is theoretical. It's a theoretical tendency of the reaction. Should the reaction want to go one way or the other? So I like to think about, you know, um, am I the kind of person who would like to sleep in on the weekend? That would be my delta G naught. Yeah, I have a theoretical tendency that I would like to sleep in on the weekend. But maybe I have to do some studying, or maybe I have a meeting in the morning. And so real life is going to come in and say, my theoretical tendency is overridden. And that's going to give me my actual delta G. So if you look at this equation here, delta G is what we care about. Delta G naught is our tendency. So this thing tells us about real life, R, T, L, N of Q. It tells us about the temperature. If the temperature changes, is the reaction going to go better or worse? Uh, and if the reaction quotient changes, Q, remember, is uh, how much products and reactants we have. So if that changes, we're going to end with, with different amounts of spontaneity. If we have a lot of products, we're going to go back to reactants, so it won't be spontaneous. On the other hand, if we have a lot of reactants and few products, sure, this thing is going to go forward to make products, depending on the tendency, of course. So if we have a tendency to go uh, in the reverse direction, um, it just depends on how much stuff we have and what temperature it has. Okay? So that's one thing. So we need to know, if we want to know something's actually going to happen, we also need to know something about its tendency. And that's what the second equation helps us to do. The tendency depends on KEQ. How much products and reactants do we end up with at equilibrium? Now, notice here, Q and KEQ, those are all about products over reactants. Okay, I'm gonna, that looks terrible. Products over reactants. Both of them are products over reactants. They are calculated exactly the same. The only thing that's different about this is that for KEQ, it's just the concentration of products at equilibrium over the concentration of reactants at equilibrium. Whereas Q is just any concentration of products and reactants that are not at equilibrium. Okay, so that's a very important distinction here. KEQ and Q are the same thing. It's just e the EQ tells you it has to be at equilibrium. Okay? And so when we look at this equation here, our KEQ tells us about the tendency of the reaction. Remember, our delta G is our tendency. Delta G naught is the tendency. So if we let something go to equilibrium, that, and we can measure how much free energy it took to get there, or gave off, or, or took in, that'll tell us about what it wants to do on its own, under standard state conditions. Now, an important thing is that we have some conditions here. Everything at one molar concentration. Now, that is almost never actually able to be measured. That's what this little, the not means. Everything's at one molar concentrations here, okay? That's never really observable, and so we have to kind of indirectly use KEQ to, uh, to assess that. Um, and so we sometimes when we're doing these reactions, we'll just need to solve this one equation. Other times we'll solve this one equation and then flow it into a different equation, like we'll use the delta G naught we saw from here, put it into this one as delta G naught, given some other stuff, and solve the actual behavior of the system. We could also use delta G naught into this equation here in the bottom. Delta G is equal to delta H naught uh, minus T delta S naught. Now delta H is enthalpy. Okay. Enthalpy, remember, is our exothermic, endothermic kind of thing. right? Uh, and if you remember, uh, which one of these uh, is going to be spontaneous depends on how much heat you're giving off. 
Uh, things that take in heat are not spontaneous. Uh, things that are exothermic are spontaneous. So in this case, delta H would be negative because we give off heat. We are losing heat from the, the system, the reaction. In this case, delta H would be positive and non-spontaneous because you have to pull in, absorb heat from the surroundings into the system to make it go. Okay? So remember our sign should be delta H negative is favorable. Delta H uh, not positive is unfavorable. Now on the other hand, delta S is our entropy term. So we have enthalpy and entropy going together to tell us whether something is tend tends to go in one direction or the other. Okay? And that can also happen under non-standard state conditions. If you notice, there's no little knots on this one. I remember that little knot means everything is a one molar concentration and it's under standard conditions. It's not STP like you see in Gen Chem. It's just standard conditions, everything at one molar concentration. Okay? So in this case, enthalpy and entropy can contribute to telling us the tendency of a reaction to do something. Uh, in real life, this thing will change that actual tendency to what we want to observe. Okay? Uh, entropy, if we remember, delta S, del entropy is weird because the second law of thermodynamics says that entropy should always be increasing in the universe. That things tend towards disorder. Things fall apart right over, net, over time. So a delta S should always go up. And so that means that delta S positive is good. Delta S negative is bad. It means it's non-spontaneous. So to kind of summarize this, delta G, um, well, let's think about delta H. Uh, delta H is spontaneous when it's negative, when you're losing heat, right? Exothermic. Delta G is just another type of delta H that is modified by a delta S. And so delta G is also spontaneous when the sign is negative. Right? Delta G Delta H should do the same kind of thing. We want delta G to be negative. We want delta H to be negative. But delta S, remember, the universe wants to be disordered. And so delta S should be going up. We should always be getting more and more disordered uh, in the whole universe as we do this kind of thing. Okay? So that's some important conventions we need to remember uh, before we start going into some problem solving. So keep that, get that down. That's a weird backwards thing, but remember... The universe wants to be disordered. Everything else wants to give off heat. Delta G is just another kind of heat. Right? It's free energy. This is free enthalpy. So free enthalpy, free energy, same kind of thing. Okay? So here's the first problem. An association between two subunits of a protein was determined to have a standard free energy change. Right? Something you want to want to practice is looking for that little delta G naught. Um, a standard free energy change of negative 57.05 kilojoules per mole. Okay. What is the KEQ for the binding reaction at 25 Celsius? Okay. So, kilojoules per mole. Okay. Um, what is the KEQ? And we know a standard here. We're asked for KEQ, so we're going to want to use the one that connects the two things. We have a delta G naught, and we have a KEQ. So in this case, we're going to want to use this fella here. Delta G naught is equal to negative R times T times the natural log of KEQ. And we're solving for KEQ. So what I want to do first, when I look at a problem like this, is I'll write it out the right way. And then I want to isolate the thing I want to solve for. In this case, we're looking for the KEQ. And so I'm going to go through and solve for KEQ. So the first thing I want to do is divide by negative RT. So now what we get is negative delta G naught over RT is equal to the log of KEQ, the natural log of KEQ. And then if you remember, um, to undo a natural log, we raise E to both sides. So I'm take the whole thing, take E to both sides. And so what we get is KEQ is equal to negative delta G naught over RT. Cool. So now what we need to do is just plug in our stuff. We need to plug in our delta G naught, so I can do that here. So I'm going to clear this writing and we'll start over. So what we had was KEQ is equal to E to the negative delta G naught over RT. 
Okay, um, I'm going to start plugging some values in to the negative negative 57.05. Now, notice that this is in kilojoules per mole. Okay, so that means we're going to have to use the correct R for this. Um, R, if you might remember, is 8.317 joules per mole Kelvin. So that is uh, one we'd want to use for something like this. Um, now, joules and kilojoules aren't the same. And so if we want to convert this, what we're going to need to do is divide by 1,000 joules per kilojoule. And we end up with 8.317 times 10 to the negative third kilojoules per mole Kelvin. Okay. So that's what I'm going to put here at R. Because we have now the right thing, kilojoules per mole, kilojoules per mole. We speak in the same unit language. So divided by 8.317 times 10 to the negative third. And what temperature are we at? We are at 25 Celsius. And remember, uh, degrees Celsius plus 273.15 is equal to our um, Kelvin temperature, which is going to be 298.15 Kelvin. So I'm going to put that in there, 298.15. So I'll plug that into my handy calculator here, 57.05. Negative of a negative is positive, divided by 8.317 times 10 to the negative third, divided by 298.15. So what I get is e to the 23rd, 23.006, not using sig figs here, is equal to keq. Are we done? No, we have to do the e. So e to that is uh, 9.81, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It's 10 to the 9th. That is a large keq. Um, is that going to make products? Yeah, it's going to make 9.8 times 10 to the 9th of the products, um, which is pretty much amazing. Um, let me make sure that's the right number. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah. Um, so that is a large, large number um, of products compared to reactants. That's 9, what, billion times more um, products than reactants. Does that make sense? We should think back at some of the other things we know. So, lots of products. Do we predict that we should make a lot of products? What's our delta G sign be uh, is telling us? What does it tell us here? Delta G naught, the tendency of the reaction, negative uh, 57 kilojoules per mole. Is that spontaneous? Yeah, negatives are spontaneous. And the larger this number is, the more and more spontaneous it is. And so... Most things in biochemistry are, you know, in the small single digit negative spontaneous. This is enormously spontaneous. And so we should expect a lot of products here from both delta G naught and from our KEQ. So that's a good way to check yourself after doing a question like this, is to make sure that this number looks enormous, people get freaked out by big numbers, matches the things you see in the stem of the question, and that'll lead you to the right answer and make you feel a lot better about putting this enormous number down. Um, because you know it should be big. Okay, so I'll pick up in part two. Thanks.